three or four kilos of spod mix. Right. And probably about, I don't know, probably a kilo of boilies. Okay. That's in a 48-hour se- hour session. It's a fair chunk for the river. Ian, welcome. How are you? I'm all right, mate. Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to this tonight. Yeah, it's going to be so. interesting. Same as we've talked about on the phone. Um, what we've always tried to do on here, or what we'll continue to try and do on here, is bring interesting people onto the show. And you've got a really good social media following, and I think you use social media very, very well. I get depressed at the amount of fish that you catch because I'm sat at work and you'll be <laughs> somewhere on the trend with another big fish in your hand. And I think if if you're around the trend angling scene or you follow you, you'll know about you very, very well, but there'll be a lot of the country who doesn't know about you. And I think today's going to be a really interesting one. Since we, since we booked it, I've been really excited about talking to you because I think I'm going to learn a lot from you as well. <laughs> so that that's my other sly reason for getting you on. I'm just I'm going to plumb you for information, mate. No problem. So um, before we get started, uh, it's worthwhile just introducing you really and, and and talk a little bit about what you do. But before we get into that. Um, Your fishing history, before we talk about where you are today as fishing guide on the Trent and probably the most prolific guide on the Trent, how did you get into fishing? Well, I got into it through my dad, really. And uh, obviously, where I used to live when I was a young boy, we had a a lake virtually down the road from me. So after school, I was down there. Six weeks holidays were on there every day. And uh, I was fishing on there, catching roach, carp, Perch, cruising, bream. Um, at this time, my dad was, he was barbell angler and he was going on the seven a lot. Right. So he took me on the seven when I was about seven or eight. And uh, I would just happily be float fishing, catching bleak, dace, little chub, while they were catching the barbell. And uh, after about a year and a half, I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind catching a barbell myself. So yeah. after catching all them little fish, uh, I remember the first ever barbell I ever had, to be honest with you, I was on, on the River Seven with my dad at Action in Shrewsbury. I was using a, a Drenham specialist rod, uh, six pound Maxima line, yeah. uh, two ounce Drenham feeder, hemp and caster. And, uh, I was casting in between some weed bed, and my dad said, like, you know, if you get one, give me a shout. So I've literally been in the water five minutes. And the rod went over. And first, I was playing it and like, wow, what's this? I mean, I've never felt the power before this. So I'm screaming at my dad, I've got one. <laughs> I remember him coming over. I remember him saying, this better not be a roach or a chub or something. <laughs> so uh, I got it in and it was like probably around about four pound. Yeah. Like, wow. I was, I was up then. From then, then on, it was just barbel, barbel. And that, that day, I had four barbels. All around that, around that size, and uh, I was just like, I was up then. There's just the power, the fight, the bite. Obviously, back then, it was obviously just a rod rest. You know, you had the rod near your arm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Back then, you were using like um, the old deck chairs you used to have back in the day. So every bite, you had to watch your rod. There was no bait runners then. It was just a Mitchell 300 a reel. I was on, and uh, I remember that day. That was, yeah, I'll never forget that day. Ever that was a, on that day, my dad had, had an eight pound barbell as well. And back then, that was a big, big fish for the seven. So, were you living up north then, or were you, were you closer to the seven? No, no, I was up north. Then. I was up north. No, no, my dad used to pick us up in the morning. Three or four of us used to go, it used to take about an hour and 45 minutes. I was going to say, it's, it's a good drive. Mind you, back then, there was less traffic on the road, you could actually get to somewhere when you needed to. Yeah, I, I were driving. I, I was sleeping. <laughs> I, I, I was sleeping. He was driving. <laughs> so, but yeah, that was. I started off on the seven with my dad and a few other of his friends, and I fished that every weekend. Every weekend was on there. Just a day, 
early morning till half eight, nine o'clock at night. So you've and, been uh, a river angler all the way through. You've not deviated. You've just barbels been all you've done. Yeah, I fished obviously the lake I fished before that. I fished that for about two or three years, catching carp up to fifteen pound. On so yeah, I enjoyed that, but I just don't think you can beat fishing on a river. No, it's just the flow. You never know what you're going to catch. I mean, you set up a barbel and you could carp, catfish, even sturgeon now. So yeah. it's just anything. It's just, it's just exciting. So yeah, I was on the back on the seven again. Then I fished all quite a, probably about twenty different rivers. Wow. On, yeah, yeah. Started from the seven, then I ventured on to the uh, the Y, and at Bredbedine, a, a famous red line stretch. And uh, back then, we were the first anglers to be allowed to barbel fish on there. It was only allowed salmon anglers. Right. Okay. And it was like meatballs, bait up with them with a bait dropper, and it, the bites. It was just instant, and it was just like wow, brilliant. I just just loved it. Uh, the scenery, with the white. So it, it's one of the nicest places to fish on the River Wye. I got to be honest. Like, I've never fished it. It's one of those places that's on my to dos, and every year I get to the start of the season and go, right, this is the year I'm going to do it, and I just. Every season gets away from me, but it's on my to-dos, definitely. Nice place. Yeah, definitely. I recommend fishing the Y. Definitely. Nice place. The fish are stunning. and They fight really well. It's got some nice chub in there as well. But yeah, it's a lovely place to be. I, I like the Y a lot. Nice. Yeah. So when, when did the Trent start calling to you? About 17 years ago. Right, okay. I started off, yeah, I started off on the upper Trent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I started off on around the uh, the Swarkston area and the Shardlow area. I started off on there and uh, catching quite a few barbel. Yeah. Again with my dad and uh, a couple of friends of mine, they, they was into barbel fishing as well. And uh, again, we used to go every weekend. Never used to night fish it, just used to go early morning, sometimes in the week. If we were off school or managed to get a day off work, you know, phone in sick way, you know, I'm feeling not <laughs> feel well. <laughs> I think, I think it's lost in time now. I think 17 years ago, you can probably admit to that one. I don't think anyone's going to come knocking for a day off. No, 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 no. But, no, that's how I started from the upper, catching some nice fish. Uh, plus, I was, I was also fishing the Warwickshire... I wasn't just fishing the Trent back then. I was fishing the Warwickshire Raven, the Hampshire Raven. I fished that for six years. So I had a lot of good fish off there. Jesus, that was some commitment. To get from where you are down to the Hampshire Avon, that's a good drive. Yeah, well, to be fair, uh, again, my dad took me. Right, you know, okay. He, yeah, so... Your dad's put some miles in there. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. Well, were you still going to sleep at this stage, or did you manage to stop up? No, no, it was about, I think it was about a four and a half hour drive, something like that. Is that all it is? Hours. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I was asleep, I was. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, no, my dad's a mad barbell angler, so... You know, he loved it, so we just went there. So, yeah, I was fishing them rivers, plus the upper. Then I started venturing on the middle trend. Yeah. And obviously places in Newark, like some famous place like Bob's Island and, you know, places like that, obviously, and got on the tidal. But, yeah, fished the trend for 17 years. That's a All long around. stretch. So you That's must it. have seen it through... If you go back 17 years, there's well, there's always been barbel in it, you know, since the, the yeah. 70s and 80s, but they're, they're nowhere near as prolific as what they are now. So you'll have seen it through the years when the, the proactive stocking's gone off and it's gone from an, a place where you're lucky to catch the odd one here and there to a stage where you can catch multiple fish right up and down. It's 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 that time, that last 17 years, that the EA's really been stocking it hard. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, back then I was on the upper. Obviously, there's not even now. There's not as many barbel in the upper as there is in the middle and the tidal. No, but you know there was there, and obviously we was catching quite a few fish. Not lots, you know, like three or four. But you know, it was a good, it's still a good area of barbel back then, really, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, 2007 we had the floods, and after that. That put it back a few years, that did. Caused yeah. a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, well, the upper continues to get harder. Um, it, 
uh, there's always been a, a few fish knocking around, but you've always had to graft for them a little bit harder. But yeah. I, it's where I fit. I do most of my barbel fishing up here, and um, I've suffered more blanks this season than I have done. But you see otter tracks knocking them out here and there, and you hear about all the local carp fishers getting turned over. And I think they're just being picked off. I don't think they've been hammered like they have in some places, but there's definitely predators in the area that are taking some of the stocks. I, I've never known it as odd as what it is at the moment. Yeah, there, yeah, there's definitely uh, quite a few otters knocking about. Definitely, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And obviously, the upper from the upper to compared to the tidal trend, it's a big difference. I think on the tidal. There's a few otters there, but they're not doing anywhere near what they're doing in the upper and no. again, the smaller rivers. Well, it's uh, it, it's chalk and cheese up here. You could think that you're on a Derwent or any of the smaller rivers. It's slower flowing and, you know, they can get in and they can really predate. If you yeah. look at somewhere like Collingham Weir, it's big, wide open, and there's always people knocking about. So uh, I yeah. think they've got a harder job on down there. Plus the numbers are more to start with. Yeah, I think if there's more people on the bank, then obviously... They don't seem to be out and about as much, but if there's a stretch what doesn't get fished a lot, you know, then they're having a field day, really, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it goes back to what we were talking about the other day when we were talking about Gunthorpe, and it's just bivy umbrella, bivy umbrella all up and down the stretch. You can yeah. walk through Willington, which is our local village, and I'll be surprised if there's an angler on once a week. And yeah. they've got they've got to feel comfortable hunting when it's like that. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, there's no there's no anglers there. They just they can come and go and please. Yeah. But if there's plenty of anglers about, then I think it, you know I think it scares them off a little bit. Yeah. So fast forward fifteen years, fourteen years to to when you decided to start to guide. What um so what does a week look like for you now? Well, I basically uh, I go to work. I mean, some people think I don't work, but <laughs> I did I did go to work Monday to Thursday. What is it you do? Uh, scaffolder. Right, okay. Uh, finish work Thursday as early as I can. So that can only be between 12 o'clock and, say, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then I'll shoot straight up to the Trent. And I'll get, obviously, sometimes I've got pegs booked, or sometimes I've got areas where I know there's not going to be many anglers. So I'll get there Thursday. And if I've got people coming on with me Friday or Saturday... Obviously, I tend to bait up an area, so obviously below me. So obviously, when they arrive Friday or Saturday, you know the swims have obviously not been touched, and obviously there's been a bit of bait going in. And basically, uh, they turn up. Let's just say they turn up for eight hours. They come for Friday, Saturday. Obviously, we do a bit of fishing. Obviously, try and teach them a bit, have a good laugh. Uh, they always, to be fair, most people have always caught with me. You know. I think I've had about eight or nine people break the PBs, uh, which is brilliant. And I, I mean, I get more nervous watching them play a fish than me. When they're playing a fish, I'm thinking, oh, don't come off, please don't come off, please don't come off. And when it's in the net, like, I think I'm more happier than they are, to be honest. <laughs> it's, it's, like a, it's like I've caught it. But yeah, I love it. I love, love helping people out. I love putting people on fish. Because I think there's enough barbell for everybody, to be honest with you. Yeah, I agree. You know what I mean? When I go fishing on my own, you know, I do have my secret stretches, but if I'm fishing on like Collingham or other well-known venues, you know, I'll help people out. Not a problem. I get a lot of people messaging me through the week. People I know, some people I don't. You know, you know, I'll help them out. You see, a lot of people travel further than I do, and they've never fished a trend ever. Yeah. Obviously, if you're traveling like six hours round trip, you want to be in with a, a bit of a chance of a fish, because on the on the tidal trend especially, you know, they're not all in, they're not in every peg. You know, sometimes you've got, to, you know, first 24 hours can be really hard, you know, until they come into your swim with the bait you've put in. So, yeah, just like helping people out catch a plenty of fish. And uh, that touch, touch wood, that's been happening all the time, to be honest with you. I mean, it has been harder this season because obviously with the mitten crabs in the tidal trend, obviously that's been making it really hard work through night. And that's normally your best time on the tidal trend, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah, and obviously after the 48 hours, and obviously they've gone home happy and I'm happy. I drive home at probably 6 o'clock in the morning, get back here because I always do something on the Sunday with the family. Obviously, I've got a six-year-old boy, and obviously he likes doing football, 
every anything anything active basically. So get back at six, seven o'clock maybe. Then I spend the day with the missus and kids. And through while I'm working Monday to Thursday, we do a bit of stuff. And obviously go out for meals and stuff like that. Play football. My little lad's football mad. Right. But well, he's been fishing with me as well. I mean, he, he'd come every week, he would. Yeah, he loves it, he does, yeah. He's been fishing, you know, I've had him on the whip, catching perch, bleak, roach and chub on the whip, so he knows what it's about, so he, he likes it. So, yeah, it's quite a busy, uh, busy week, really, to be fair, but just as long as people catch fish with me, learn a bit, you know, go home happy, that's all what I'm bothered about, really. So you don't get much time anymore for your own personal fishing. It feels like you're you're trying to struggle to crush as much in as you possibly can to every week. No, well, I fish Thursday. Thursday night's my night. Right, okay. I'll fish Thursday night. And depending where we are, you know, from the tide or if the weather's really bad, uh, sometimes I won't fish in the day and I'll get my rods out at night. Uh, depending, obviously... I like to take people when the weather's not too bad. If it's windy, like windy and rainy all day, then basically you're sat in your bivvies. You know, you're not going to be standing outside for three or four hours. But yeah, Thursday is my time, really. I mean, sometimes I get on the river on a Wednesday. You know what I mean? So depending if I've done my jobs, you know, I sometimes do get my jobs done on a Wednesday, what I have to do Thursday. So, I, I think I, uh, now you mentioned it, I can remember seeing one of your Facebook posts this week. I think you were trying to get to the river, and somebody had said, "Yeah, it's a straight pickup." And you took a photo, and there was just scaffolding, just scattered everywhere. <laughs> and it was just like, "Yeah, this isn't a straightforward pickup." Yeah, no, that was that was a bit. Uh, yeah, I thought it was just gonna be a nice, easy job, and I got there, and it was like, I was not happy. Put it that way, not happy. <laughs> but, but I still managed to get to the river. You know, in decent time. So, yeah, I normally do like a Wednesday night, Thursday and Thursday night. And uh, sometimes I'm only doing 24 hours, so they'll, they'll come Saturday, so I'll get Thursday, Friday. So, uh, yeah. so, so if somebody came to you with two different scenarios, so you've got customer A who says, I'd like to catch a lot of fish, and you've got yeah. customer B who says, I want to catch a PB. I'll, I'll sit all weekend, but I just want a big fish. Without giving away your super secret places, for for somebody who's never been to the Trent before, where would you aim them at? Well, I I ask that question when they book in with me. I do ask that question: Do you want to catch lots of fish or do you want a PB? And obviously, if they say they want to catch lots of fish, then uh, I tend to go on Collingham a lot, uh, Bob's Island a lot, right? Places like that. Yeah, there's a lot of people who come with me. You know, I haven't got club books because they're not from around Newark area and Nottingham. So, obviously, you're governed by day ticket venues. Unless you can book on, like, like last week was on Malkin Lane Fishery. So, you can book on there, you see. So, I'll take into to them kind of places because you can catch lots of, you know, lots of fish, to be fair. Yeah. And if they want to catch big fish, then I'll take them to other stretches where they've still got a chance of catching one or two fish, but, you know, they might set it there for one bite but that one bite could be a 16 17 or even even bigger yeah but i always say to them like if you want a, the big fish you're better booking in i think november onwards personally yeah because before then in the summertime months you know you can ca- you can normally catch quite a few fish on most venues to be fair so i, I always me, me myself i always target catching something bigger than my pb november onwards I mean, I always like January, February, March, to be fair. Especially March, when they're up there at the biggest. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's starting to creep, it's starting to warm up a teeny bit. Do you, um, do you go as far as measuring water temperatures? Is that a factor in your fishing? I, yeah, I do do the water temperature a lot in winter. I mean, I'm, I'm fishing no matter what. I'm fishing, if it's minus two, <laughs> I'm there anyway. Well, I do, I do do the water temperature, and obviously, if the water temperature's just say it's four point nine degrees, yeah, and obviously, way there it starts to come up to like five point one, five point two. You know, you know you're in with a good chance of catching because it's on the rise. But obviously, if it's a cold weekend and it's dropping, it's just one of them. You just got to uh, obviously. I can't, I can't. I say to the customer, my, my customers or my clients, can't do nothing about the weather. Yeah. So obviously, you just got to. Uh, I mean. 
in winter, you obviously on, on one rod, and, uh, and people who come with me, you know, I do tell to bring maggots because maggots right. are really good in winter. You know, you know, it can be devastating to be fair. So you can still catch them. I was catching last year when it was like minus one, two, and you know, catching barbel like about six o'clock in the morning, the coldest time of the day. So I think certain stretches you've got a chance. I know quite a few stretches where you can catch when it's really cold and certain stretches where you haven't got a chance. Oh, that's so, just yeah. experience. They, they, yeah. they, there's no accounting for hours on the bank and putting the time in and learning the river. And th there's no way you can, anyone can get to that level of knowledge without putting the hours in. But as I've talked about on here before, I think that guides are invaluable from taking you a position where you've got literally no knowledge whatsoever and spending two days with somebody like you, the nuances that you can teach them in a very, very short amount of time is worth maybe five or six seasons wandering up and down the trend, wondering what you're doing wrong. Yeah, well, a lot of people obviously who come with me, obviously might only go on the trend three times a year. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, I do get a lot booking in with me three times a year because they say to me, you know, we take us on three different stretches. So we've got options for when we come down. Because a lot of people, I mean, I've got a bloke coming this week. He's from Devon. It's like, right. yeah, you know, so if you're coming that far, you know, you, you want to have options. You want to be on a, a venue where you've got a chance of catching. So obviously, yeah, they do obviously come from far away. They come from miles, to be fair. So if I was in their shoes, I'd want to be with a guide so they could put me on a stretch where I knew uh, if I come, I've got confidence of catch, catching a few fish. Because a lot of people make the mistake where on the trend, they think, oh, it's a trend. We'll just cast in. It's one a chuck. Yeah. It's not like They'll that. climb up the line. So you, do, yeah. you don't even have to cast. They just they throw themselves on the bank. Yeah, it's like that uh, Des O'Connor advert back in the day where he put that... <laughs> He put the uh, Des O'Connor record. Russ Abbott was. Russ Abbott, it? yeah. Yeah, yeah. He put that in and he jump out. But it can be like that on the trend. Don't get me wrong. But you know, this season especially, obviously, if you, you've got to work, you've got to work your swim. You so know, I, to... I think it's been more difficult this year. And I, we talked about predation earlier on, but I, I think this season on the trend has been one of the hardest seasons I've known. So I'm glad you're saying that. And there's definitely signs on the upper that the crayfish are coming in. I've not had a mitten crab yet. But outside of the mitten crab thing, what, what do you put it down to? Why has it been so hard? I think I think the floods have caused a lot of damage from last season. Right. Yeah, I think it's changed the riverbeds, the weed, the weed a lot of the weeds gone. Yeah. You no know, pegs where there was gravel will now all be mud. I think that hasn't helped. I think obviously on the tidal of the mitten crabs, they've come right up to Collingham now. I mean, they've always been in the high tidal, you know, like Gainsborough away and Littenborough, they've always been there, but they've come right down to uh, Collingham now. And they seem to be there like in hundreds and hundreds. It's like, you know, you've got to check your bait every half an hour through Jesus. nights. You know, so they've come, so that's made it hard. And I think the barbel are there. But I'm seeing it as if you if you've got five or six of them mitten crab around your bait and the big mitten crabs, not little, yeah. I don't think a barbel's got a chance of even seeing your bait. You don't mind getting to it. So I think them mitten crabs will probably go for a barbel because the ones I've been catching are like like the bodies are like nearly eight inch in diameter. Yeah. Well they they're big things, you know. So I you I'm get at the beginning of the season, I was getting people messaging me and ringing me saying, We've got barbel jumping all over his baits, we've seen them all day, can't get a bite. I think that's what it is. I think the fish are there, but they can't get to your bait. So I think if you've got a bait on, then you'll catch. I mean, my dad was on the eye tidal this weekend, just gone. And he tried everything. And in the end, he had two pieces of sweet corn on. And they weren't touching that. Right. And he, and he was catching barbel. But before, he had meat on, boilies. And it, was, it, it weren't lasting 20 minutes. That's, so think, uh, that's not good. Yeah, so I think these the floods obviously cause a lot of damage. Certain fish have moved from certain areas. They might come back. You know, I think I do think quite a few of the fish have gone into the the tributaries of the trend, like the Dove, Derwent, and the Dom. Yeah, and also the, the mating crabs on the tidal. Because I've been on the middle trend, and that seems to have been fishing quite well. To be fair. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and the people who fish the middle trend more than me. I've said they've seen more barbel this season. So 
That's interesting. They've come up from the tidal. Who knows? So do you change how you fish depends on whether you're on the middle or the tidal or, or do you just have one approach? No, uh, if I'm on the tidal, normally, apart from this season, I'll bait up heavily on the tidal. Right, okay. Because of the of the tides, you know, the bait's not there long. You know, you've got barbel, you've got all the little fish, you eat it all, it's not there long. This season, I've not been baiting up hardly anything because of the mitten crabs. I don't want to encourage them with, you know, pellets and boilies and whatever else. So I've just been using PVA bags on on the tidal. Yeah. But on the on the middle trend, I've been putting a, a little bit of spod mix in with some crushed boilies and some pellets. So uh that seems to have been working quite well. So kind of uh, reverse in, what you usually do then. Yeah. Uh, normally on the tidal I put a lot of bait in. Right. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you season. what what would you say is a lot? Because different people see a lot of different things. I'd probably put about uh well see I use obviously them river spoppers, so I mean kilo I would probably say three or four kilos of spod mix. Right. And probably about I don't know, probably a kilo of boilies. Okay. That's in a forty hour session a forty eight hour session. It's a fair chunk for the river. Yeah, well, on the tidal, it's not there long. It's just, if you've got big tides especially, it's gone. Four or five hours, it's gone. Right, okay. And on the, and on the tidal trend, there's a lot of, um, lot of small fish. You know, you know they're, they're all over it. So it's not there long. When I'm fishing the middle trend, obviously, I wouldn't ever put that much in. So on the middle trend, it can stay there a lot longer. Yeah. But on the tidal, it's different. different ball game tidal. Big river. The features are normally under the water. And on the tide, I think if you put a big bed of bait down, normally, not this season, but any other season, that's the feature. When the barb will swim through, I want them to stay. If you've got no bait in there, you might pick the odd fish off. Yeah. But then they go. But if you've got bait going in consistently, you know, they tend to come back more. Right, okay. But obviously this season, obviously not done that this season because of the mitten crabs. So uh, that's why I've gone on the middle trend quite a bit. And obviously... In winter, the only difference to do in winter really is I have maggots on one rod, yeah, and boilies on the other. Do you and not get bitted up... out on the maggots? No, not in winter. Oh, okay. No, no, no. I bait up with a uh, emp and maggots in winter. In winter, I'll take a gallon of maggots. Jeez. Yeah, and they got not all of them go in with this river spopper. I put quite say I don't know five pints in. Then I'll fish all fish with PVA bags with maggots in. And just keep it going in. That's on my top rod. And my bottom rod will be on a, a boilie. And that'll just be on a PVA bag with some boilies in and a few pellets. For those listening who don't know what a spopper is, um, can you describe it? Well, basically, it's just a... Well, the carp rods are using it for years. Obviously, a few people I know have converted them now, so they sink. Yeah. So you chuck them, obviously chuck them in, and they're like a bait dropper, but basically a bit more aerodynamic. You can cast them further get more bait out and obviously they sink straight to the river you know, bottom they open up you when you reel them back they come across the top it's just the same as obviously what the cart was used it just sinks but you know it's a great bit of kit for getting bait down so it's effectively like um oh, what are those cages they used to use in the 80s that so it's a bait dropper you can cast yeah it's a, it's a bait yeah i find with the, obviously the bait droppers obviously if you're chucking out a distance you used to open on impact yeah you're all right with a bait dropper if you're 10 foot out or, you know, in the margins. But obviously on the tidal trend, sometimes you're chucking, you know, halfway out or, you know, so it's just easy with the spopping. You'll be surprised how easy you can get a lot of bait in with them. Yeah, indeed. So while we're talking about bait, I know you're sponsored by Vortex. Yeah. Uh, you seem to do very, very well on it. So there's no doubting that it's good bait. Uh, what, what would you say makes a good Trent barbel bait? If you were going to put a bait together... Well, if I was to put, obviously, quality ingredients, is obviously, I've seen how the baits are made at Vortex. Yeah. By, by Nigel, Nigel Shooter. And a can, you, can you reveal what's in it, or is it a trade secret? No, I can't reveal what's in it, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've seen them, I've seen them being made by, uh, obviously, Nigel, Jay and Craig, and whoever else drops in. And, you know, I know they are the quality ingredients, so I always think, 
me personally, I want to be fishing with, you know, the best bait I can because I'm out all the time. So the, the ingredients are top notch, you know, the best, the best you can buy because Nigel who makes them is a perfectionist. He's been doing it 40 years. He's a bit of a, he's a, he's a scientist as well, you see. So anything you need to know about baits, he knows it. I mean, I don't know a great deal about baits, to be fair. I, I know what I want it to do. What I like them to be smelly. But just as long as the good quality ingredients what go in them, obviously they keep the colour. I don't like them fading to, you know, some, obviously if you've got a bait in the water for, you know, four or five hours, you know, they can fade a teen a little bit. But obviously with the Vortex baits, you know, the quality, in my opinion, obviously I've seen them made. I, I wouldn't use them if they weren't quality because I'm out all the time, you see. Yeah. You know, I, I tell people about them all the time. So, you know, my name's there. I've told people about the bait. So my, you know, I'm so saying it with myself. So I know the quality of bait. So uh, I've caught on hydro shrimp, uh, liver enzyme, the CKO. I've got my own green bait this season, which you've got like quite a few different ingredients in, which I'm trying this season. And obviously that's more of a winter bait, but I have caught on it through summer. So can people order that or is that just your... No, that's just my bait at the moment. Obviously, okay. I'm just I'm just testing that at the moment. Obviously, it's done all right, and some have had barbel chub and carp on it, but it's more designed for winter, to be fair. Okay. So I won't so I won't really know how it goes until you know I've done a good full season on it. But the hydro shrimp, CKO, and the liver, and a few other baits they do, they all catch barbel. I've caught barbel on all of them. Well, that that's all that matters. You you see. Uh, some anglers who will take on sponsorships just to get some cheap bait and yeah. there is some cheap bait out there and i think yeah, you hit the nail on the head if you know these quality ingredients in especially for you if you've got punters coming along the last thing you want to be worrying about is whether your bait's going to catch fish or not so it speaks volumes that you're prepared to put it on your hook yeah yeah i was using vortex baits for about a full season for for they even asked me to come on the team you know, I'm not obviously it's great to be on the team because they're all good lads and you know it's like a bit of a family. But you know, I wouldn't be bothered if I weren't on the team. I'd still use the bait because the bait's brilliant. Right. Cool. I don't I don't use it, I'm not in it to uh, get free bait and all that lot. If I was using a bait and it costs twenty quid a kilo, I'd buy it. Because I think confidence in a bait is like key. Yeah. You know, some people, I mean, I'm confident I catch a lot on spam. You know, some people I know, like my dad. And his friend uh, Howard Maddox, they only I mean, he only uses spam. He won't use anything else because he's confident on that. Some, yeah. some people's confident on source, but I mean there is other good boilers out there. You know what I mean? Some of my friends use you know other companies. I mean there is a lot of rubbish boilers out there to be honest. But in summer, you, I think you'll catch most things. I always say a quality bait will catch a fish in winter when it's hard. Yeah. Over a bait what isn't that quality made. Well, they're not so fussy. In in the um, in the winter, a, a fish might go a lot longer without needing to feed. So yeah. they can they can pass by bait that's crap, and they just if, if they don't feel like it, they don't have to pick it up. But if they go past a good quality bait, if they've only yeah. got to eat a few boilers each day, they'll go for the ones that are higher quality. So I think you're absolutely yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, that's, obviously the stuff what's in the bait, obviously it's all you know good stuff for the fish as well. Yeah, and obviously there's a few things in there. What the, you know, what the barb will really love. You know what I mean? I mean, to be honest with you, I can't remember what the, what, what it's called. <laughs> that's more that's more that's more Nigel's department. But yeah, they are they are quality baits, and I say so I, I use them all year round as well as uh, spam and maggots. So I'm happy to use them baits, no problem anywhere. So. Um, getting into sort of nitty gritty and the detail a little bit, but I think there's a lot of people who'd be un unhappy if I didn't ask you these nerdy kind of questions. Yeah, rig, wa well. rig wise, do you change your rigs or do you just go, This is my rig that catches barbel and you take it everywhere? I, I change them in the day to have a fish at night. Okay, it's the same rig, I just basically make the hook length in the day a lot longer. Uh, and I try and blend in my M rigs to the riverbed the best that I can. And if I can't see it, then I'm happy. I mean, the barber can probably see it, but I can't, so I'm confident with that. And in the day, you'll go longer hook link, try and get away with a smaller lead, just a little PVA bag on the hook. I'll still use Vortex 16 mil cocoons. 
if I'm struggling, I might cut one in half. I've also got some, obviously, Ferta pellets, which are 14 mil, so they're a bit smaller. But that's my rig I use in the day. And I just think I catch in the day, because I think I try and blend me, me end rig to the river bed, to be honest with you. So, so it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. But I'm just more confident that way. But there's people who miss stuff like that. There's people who go, well, I only catch fish at night. They only feed at night. Well, they don't. They feed all the way through. But it's those little things like, you know, just stepping, well, making your hook link longer, stepping down in the diameter of it, just in the day, just to give you that extra bit of confidence that nicks you the odd bite here and there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I use 25 pound soft sinking braid, very supple. But in the day, oh, okay. sometimes, I'll, sometimes I'll go to 15. Right, but always braid. Eh? But always braid. Yeah, always braid, yeah. Soft sinking braid, not coated, not some, just very supple. It's dead light, you see. So I'm thinking, when that barbel picks that air rig up, you know, if you can't feel my braid, there's less resistance for it to spit, you know. Where if, you wear, if you're using a, like a, a braided, a, a coated braid, yeah, and it's quite heavy, I think as soon as they feel resistance, they spit the bait out or try to. Well, the braid I use is very light. So, you know, I think that helps me as well. And plus, I watch my rods as much as I can, really. I mean, you can't do it all 24 hours or 40 hours. It's impossible. But I tend to wait every little knock and bang. They're not always one-toners. No, sometimes it's just like a little tap like that, and I'll hit it. Because sometimes they're picking the bait up, and they're obviously just that little movement. Sometimes you can spit it out without you even knowing it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll do that in the day. At night, it's a different. I don't. I watch them at night, and I'll, obviously, I don't watch them as much at night like I do in the day. And uh, what I sometimes even I can sometimes keep me up lengths the same length, or sometimes I shorten them a bit at night. So at night, I don't think it really matters that much. To be fair, it's dark. You know, I think if it's well present, you know, you've got a nice, that's flying flat on the bottom. You know, yeah, rig's all nice. Your bait's just nice. You know. Got a nice bit of bait going in. I think you know. I think you'll catch it at night. But in day, you in the day, you got to be a bit more, a bit more wiser in the day. I think you got to be. I try and think about a bit more in the day. You know, if we can catch them. You know, if I'm not catching in certain spots, I'll just sometimes when I see fish jump, even on the river, I could it might not be a barbel. It might it could be anything, but I'll cast that jumping fish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I've had a lot of fish doing that. You know, so. You know, sometimes see, the people, I work at it through the day, you see. Some, a lot of people don't work at it on the trend. They'll, they'll come, they'll cast in, have a few drinks or whatever else they're doing, leave it for five or six hours. Because obviously they expect the trend, it's going to be one a chuck. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of people who, who I know who catch quite well on the trend, you know, put the, put the time and effort in. They, they do a lot of work. I mean, sometimes, yeah, you can cast in and you're there straight away. But if I'm doing a 48-hour session, normally the first 24 hours is pretty slow. You know, you get the odd fish. But then they come into that bait because you've worked it about 24 hours. Then you can end up having six or seven fish. So then it looks a good session. Obviously, I'm at night. I'm, I'm working it through the night, you see. If, I've, if I'm catching through the night, say if I've got a caught barbel, it's in my net, then... I'll get the spot brown, put three or four spoppers in, just give that little freebie bait. Then obviously then we're going to let the fish re recover for five minutes. Then I'll take the hook out. If it's a good fish, quick weight, quick photograph, let it revive in the net for five minutes. That's, you know, by that time you cast back out, you know, they've had that bit of freebie bait for a little while. You know, then if you can, if I keep doing that, you know, I'll keep getting the spot out through night. But a lot of people are casting at eight o'clock at night, then, won't reel back in and won't cast out again until four in the morning. Then they, then they wonder why they're not catching. I mean, they can still get the odd fish, but I think if you work a swim, you get more fish. Effort, equal, effort equals reward. Yeah, I and, and, and I think that's the same for all branches of fishing. And, and I do get, and I, I'm guilty of this as well, if you've worked all week, sometimes you just want to go and cast out and have a beer and catch your breath. And it's sometimes it's not always about catching a fish. But you're absolutely right. If you want to catch fish, you've got to work. You can't turn up to any decent fishery anywhere in the country and the fish are just going to crawl out of the water. If, if you really want the fish and you want to catch, you've got to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I get people, obviously, 
you know, some people want to just come for a social, yeah. get the rods out if they catch, if they don't, they're not bothered, and that's great. But obviously, if I've got people with me, obviously if I'm guiding or myself, yeah. you know, you want to catch fish. You know what I mean? And if you've drove like three and a half hours to get there, and you're doing like 48 hours, you know, you want to catch fish. When you're driving home, if you've caught fish, it's always a better drive home, isn't it? it if you're blind, well, the, you know. The, it's the not other thing is as well, you're... It's all right nipping for a short session and not putting the effort in and you just, you know, you're catching your breath. But for me, if I'm going away from my missus and my kids and same as you say, I'm putting fuel in the car, I'm paying for 30, 40 quid worth of bait, yeah. then I'm there to catch fish. I'm not dicking around. I'm not looking at my phone. I'm there. You know, it's by the grace of God that your missus lets you go fishing. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not a given in any relationship. And if you've got a pass and you've got an amount of time, you go and you put the effort in and you want to go home with a photo at the end of it. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah, you want to, yeah, you're going there to, you're going there to get a few. A lot of people have come with me, obviously, have either not caught any barbel, caught small barbel and just want a big one. You know, I had a bloke uh, a few months back. He had one at £9. That was his PB. And he, he was like, oh, it was so made up. It was unbelievable. And he, I think he drove from, I think near Scotland, I think he was, to be fair. <laughs> And uh, he said, that'll do me now. I'm not bothered if you don't catch another fish. Yeah. I pit, you know, obviously, I think he had three, to be fair, and a few chub. So he was like, just seeing the smile on the faces just does it for me. You know, yeah. that's, I love it. I do. That's what, but, but yeah, you're there. To, you know, obviously, if you turn up at the bank and there's eight or nine of you and you're on a social, you're not going to catch many fish. Yeah. There'll be the odd fish caught. <clears throat> But obviously you're having a social, so you're not bothered. You're just there meeting your mates, catching up, having a laugh, a bit of banter. Obviously people who come with me, obviously, you know, we still have a laugh and, you know, a good crack, but, you know, they're there to learn learn stuff and catch. Because obviously they see me catching fish on the trend for the last probably six, seven years on Facebook or wherever else. And, you know, the rivers they fish, obviously, there's not many, a lot of them, there's not many barbell in there anymore because, mm. you know, because the damage the otters have caused over the years or whatever, you know, there's not a big head of barbell in them little rivers. So they come up to the trend, and obviously, when you get to the trend, it's like, it's like, wow, where'd you, where'd you chuck? Where'd you cast? Especially <laughs> the tidal trend. It's like, I had two lads with me the other week. They fished like uh, the Loddon and places like that, and they turned up to the side and was like, how'd you fish here? Because it's like about probably 10 times as wild as the Loddon. Yeah. So it's like a needle, like they said, it's a needle and an a stack, isn't it? So, yeah, it's just a different ball game with Trent. Well, it's just it's a different skill. Like like anything, you learn your watercraft, and you get to learn where the creases are. You get to look at where the flow is, and after a while, you get to know where the fish are going to be to preserve as much energy as possible to get as much food coming past them as possible, and you, you get to be able to read it after a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, back in the day, I used to learn about. And I used to still used to I used to lead about 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 a year and a half ago. Still used to do it on stretches not been or every year the the river changes. So I like to used to have a lead about. I used to have an ounce lead. Used to count it down. Yeah. And if it took four seconds, I would double that. So it'd be like so instead of being eight before it'd be eight. So I count it as eight foot. Yeah. So I'd do that. Obviously now I've got I've got a deeper chirp. So obviously it's just a lot easier. So not for the not for finding the fish. Just for the depths and the features. Yeah, I'm with you. I spent years and years leading about, probably about two hours leading about in the same swim, just trying to find the gravel, the drop offs, the snags, the weed, trying to gauge where the deep bits are and where the shallow bits are. So obviously a lot of people can't, you know, they can't do that really. Obviously, on the on the trend, especially the tidal, where the features are underneath the water. Obviously, you're looking for the crease lines. You want to get on the crease lines or if you've got, say, a bit of water on the river, you're looking for them slacks close in. Because you will catch the barbel literally right under your feet. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people cast over the barbel. You don't, sometimes you don't need to chuck that far. It's like, it's like the water chucked at far bank all the time. You catch them right under your feet. If you're quiet, you've got to be quiet on the river. Yeah. You can't turn up making a ruck of noise. When I turn up, if I'm on my own or I've brought anybody with me, it's like set up quietly. You know, don't make any noise. You know what I mean? If you want a bit of a chat and a bit of a laugh, stand way back off the river. 
because them bar bucking here, you, and they, they can hear all the vibrations and everything. So if you if you're not if you're making a load of noise and the radio on and shouting and screaming, you know don't expect to catch many fish close in. But if you're quiet and you know you're there to fish, you can catch fish right under your rod tip. So you mentioned um, when it was flooded, when um, you know and it's up and chocolatey and, and running hard. Where, where would you typically head for in those? If you were out fishing on your own and you just wanted to nick a fish, where roughly? And again, I, I don't want secret spots. So I would never ask you, but general area, where would you head for? Well, I'm lucky, really, because obviously I've got years of experience, so I know when the rivers up, where to go and where not to go. Yeah. So obviously, if I'm on my own, I've got people with me. I always have an idea. I mean, through the week, I'm looking through the weather app the river levels, the tides and everything. Because when I'm taking people with me, I've not made the decision where we're going really sometimes till the Thursday. Because obviously you've got to allow for the river to come up or drop in or but if the river's up a lot, then I do have like quite a few areas to go where I know, you know, we've got a good chance of catching. And them areas when it's normal level, you wouldn't fish. Yeah. But when there's like eight, nine foot of water on it, you would fish. So I'm lucky, really. Just years of experience knowing where to go when there's water on it. All right, got you. But if, you, but if you've not been on the trend, and you, you know, a lot of people just turn up. It's, when there's six, seven foot, eight foot of water on it, it's a different ball game. Yeah. You know, if you've not been on the trend much, you know, unless you unless you know a few friends who put you on a few places, you're gonna struggle because mm. you could be fishing an area where, you know, you could be casting on top of a tree. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen the I've seen the river when it's like rock bottom. Yeah. What I used to do back in the day is take pictures of all the swims I fished when it was low, mega low. So when it does come up, even the pegs I don't fish now, but I do fish when there's water on it. I take pictures of them. So when it comes up, I know where the bottom of the river is. I know where the the grass is. I know where the whatever bushes there is. So I've got them on my phone. So. Mate, your attention to detail. I don't know if you realise you do this, but you know, just having spent the last hour, it's just the little things that you talk about and how you talk about it. And there's just a noticeable separation from how a lot of people fish. And same as I say, it's a broad church and everybody can, you know, go and catch a fish and enjoy it. But that's, I think that's next level stuff. You know, just thinking to yourself, I'll capture this swim. A lot of people will take a picture of a swim because they'll go, right, I'm going to cast there and I'm going to cast there. And then next time I come, if I've caught a fish, I'll know where I cast to. But there's very few f- people think, I'm going to take a photo of this and then when I come up and the river's four foot deeper, I'll know what it looks like. It's just, You've got some very subtle little edges that are very, very clever. Yeah, I just, I've, all, I've just always done that, basically. It's just so... Because obviously, if you're fishing somewhere you've never fished before and it's water on it, you know, you, you want to know your bait's on the bottom. If it's in a piece of grass or a tree, and you don't know, you, you know, you're wasting your time, aren't you? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just you. think, I just think if you just, if you just put that effort in, I just think it, it's just it's effort, I think. But basically, I like to set up a game plan when I'm going fishing. I always like people say to me, like, you're not sick of catching all these barbell and all that lot. And no, to me, it's like you, you try to outwit the fish, aren't you? Yeah. You know what I mean? You, you try to outsmart it. You know, it's like, I know it's like a bit weird, but I try and think as a as a barber would. I'm certain on my setups and how they feed, why you use longer hook links. I use like, sometimes I use four foot hook links now. And um, I, I, the reason that for that being is, if you picture your line going in the water and you've got your lead, Obviously, if you've got a long hook link and the barbel comes in and he thinks, oh, what's that? So it's turned round then to have a look and its tail's come round. Yeah. And it's just, it's took your bait. But if you've got a short hook link of, say, 18 inch, yeah, there's a good chance of that barbel coming round and hitting your line where your lead is. Yeah. As soon as it does that, it's going to spook and go. Now, in summer, that's not so bad because you'll come back in summer. But in winter, you could be sat there for eight hours for one fish. I and mean, then that one fish could be an 18 pounder. So I don't want it to be spooked best way, you know, if, if, you know, so I want the longer hook link. So when it, it, there's less chance of it hitting the line. So that's my way of thinking. And obviously I see a lot of people using 
the paste in the leads, which in winter I would never do, you see, because I'm thinking the barbell's coming to that lead. It's not coming to your hook, mate. The fat paste is in that lead. That's the biggest scent trail in yeah. that lead. So it's coming to that lead. So I'm thinking it's going to hit that lead and spook. Yeah. Because I've seen people do that and they get little taps. I've been getting taps all day. And it's fish coming in and they're hitting the lead and spooking. Where if I use paste, it's on the, it's near my hook. Yeah. I want it, any fish to come in, in winter especially, I want to come near my hook, not that lead. So that's one reason I don't use paste in the lead. And it's another reason why I use long hook links. Just without thinking, really. No, no, I like it. I think it's sound thinking, mate. And um, as I say, you clearly sit and you think about it and you you tweak it depends on what your circumstances are. And you, you I think as well, when you said um, you're trying to outwit the fish, somebody once described fishing to me as you sit down and you do a thousand piece jigsaw and you've got it all sorted out and it gets to the next day and somebody throws it all off and you've got to sit and you've got to piece it all together again because no two days are the same. Just when you think you've got it cracked, you've got to start it again because what worked yesterday won't necessarily work today. Oh, yeah. Every day is different. You know, you think you've worked them out and they'll, and they'll just do something different. I mean, I've yeah. been fishing for barbell way over 30 odd years now and I'm still learning. You know, I'll, I'll listen to anybody, I will. And sometimes a certain idea I'll think, nah, that's not going to work. And sometimes I'll think, you know, that's a good idea, that is. I mean, yeah. that is a real good idea. So obviously, I was, an idea I've thought myself, obviously, sometimes I use pellets, the 14 mil ones. Yeah. What I tend to do is put a cocktail stick sausage through the hole of the pellet. Yeah. So obviously, then cut it off at the end of the pellet. So you've got your, you've got your air stop. And you've got your cocktail sausage going through the... And because it's, bu it's, it's buoyant, isn't it, a cocktail sausage? Yes. So I've noticed that if you do that, if on a 14 mil pellet, it, they seem to move more in the flow. Yeah. Acting a bit more naturally. So I've always done that. And I uh, always seem to do well doing just just little... I know it's like, it might sound daft, but I think if a bait can move naturally in the water, because I do a lot of rolling meat. Yes. And obviously... That's the best tactic going. Because it's natural. If you get a piece of meat rolling down natural and there's chub or barbell there, they'll have it every time. Yeah. So I try to just, again, it's just uh, just trying different little things, to be honest with you. So I started mucking about with soft plastics last year and um, I was casting out and I was doing okay. And I cast it out and my son said something to me and I stood and I talked to him and the next minute I did the most violent take that, I've, that I had all day. And all that was happening was that the rubber was just bouncing down the gravel as if it was just a dead fish. So I wasn't jerking it back and I wasn't putting any movement into it. It just looked like a dead fish that was just bouncing down the gravel. And that's the one where the fish absolutely hammered it. And you think to yourself, well, that's how a dead fish would look. If they were, if they were yeah. looking out for prey coming down and they see that naturally coming down so i think sometimes they they expect things to look in a certain way and if they come up and inspect it and it's just sat there because your hook's too heavy and it's not sitting right yeah. on the bottom like you say they'll go yeah that's not right and in summer it's fine because as you say they'll come back they'll have two or three bites of the cherry they'll move around and they're very active but if you're looking for that one fish coming to look at your bait once and it doesn't look right that might be your bite of the day gone yeah you might only get that one bite, especially in winter, so you want everything perfect. Well, again, like I say, in my opinion, obviously rolling meat or trotting on a float, you know what I mean? They're the two best methods for catching barbel, in my, my opinion. Especially if it's a bit hard, you know, the, the static baits will catch a fish, you know, you will get them in the day and night, but I just, obviously, if you're rolling meat, you're covering more water. Yeah, of course you are. You know, you know what I mean? So, of course, uh, I've caught a lot of fish on rolling meat. And again, another thing I use on there is plasticine. Instead yeah. of, uh, I used to use swan shot quite a bit. And obviously, sometimes you can get, still get snagged up on that, on the fish. So, a resort of just, uh, just crimping on a teeny little BB and having a piece of plasticine. And obviously, if you get snagged up, the plasticine comes off. So basically, you're freelining, you, 
for lunch with me, so there's no weight there for it to be snagged up. Do you tend so, to use braids when you're doing that? No, I just use uh, my 15 pound mono line. Right. So I, I use a bit of a lighter rod, so because when it's bouncing down, I can feel everything right through the rod to where the butt is. So I can feel everything. Sometimes I'm holding the line with my finger, so you can feel it bouncing down. But obviously, when you get a good, obviously when it's bouncing down, it takes it's like it can rip the rod out. It's like your heart's like boom. It's like wow, what? So a lot of the bites throwing me are like even when the the chub are having a go at it, you can still you can still feel it straight away. You know what I mean? It's like it's just like you can bouncing down, and next minute bang, it's like adrenaline rushes going. So and it's good, but when you've caught one on rolling me, you feel like more of achievement because like yeah. you've worked at it more. Yeah, well, it's a bit more of a purist method. Not that there's anything wrong with you know sitting behind static baits, but you just feel like you're out and you're hunting when you're doing stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I fish static baits up, you know, ninety percent of the time. But if I'm on a stretch of river, I can roll me. You know, I will do that definitely. Mm. You know, sometimes you can pick yourself a couple of fish up like. In the day when it's really hard, people go, "Why were you catching in the day?" Obviously, it's because I'm also rolling meat. A rolling bait will catch a fish in the day. Yeah, when it, you know, when a static bait won't. Well, as I was saying before, it looks natural. Meat doesn't sit in one yeah. place; it bounces down, and the fish has got one chance to get it because if he doesn't, it's going to be four or five meters past him by the time it looks again. So that's probably why you're getting the violent takes. Yeah, and a lot of the takes are. Basically, when the meats roll right round to the edge, and it's before the barbel think, I can't. If it goes any further, I'm not going to get it. Yeah. And that's when you get your fish. Yeah. Right. I mean, when it, to be fair, when when they had the seventeen one, that was on rolling meat. So is that your that is that your PB or? Yeah, that's my PB seventeen one. Yeah. Okay. I had that on piece of meat rolling meat. Yeah. And that was. A... So how big do you think they're going to get in the trend? Well, obviously, there's fish in the trend now of 20, definitely. Obviously, the more bait goes in, they seem to be getting bigger and bigger, to be fair. Mm. I think a lot of fish are up in weight this season due to the floods. I think they're yep. about to feed more, to, obviously, to battle against the floods. I mean, obviously, a lot of recognisable fish on the trend, which you've known over the years. You know, they seem to be up in weight by like, over a pound okay. at this time of year. So... Yeah, I think this this fish in the trend of twenty. So, mm, watch out for the record sometime soon. Yeah. So, looking at the guys that you're guiding, and I get that there'll be lots of different experience coming in. Um, what would you say is the most common, either common mistake or common? mispractice what's the thing that a lot of them do wrong or they would do wrong if you weren't guiding them well one obviously number one uh, sleeping really is (laughs) it's when to sleep and when not to sleep you see obviously when a lot of people come with me and they're not used to doing 48 hours i normally say like fish for a few hours in the day get your rods in and have a few hours sleep because you want to be awake at night. And what they tend to do is obviously they're awake for the first 24 hours because they're excited, which you would be. And the next 24 hours, obviously, they might have had a few fish the first 24 hours. So again, they're still excited, you know. So that the second night is like they start wavering a bit because they've not had that sleep in the day. Yeah. So a lot of people do, obviously. And if you sleep at night and your rods are out for six, seven hours, obviously, you know, you're relying on that one little piece of boily for a bite, which you still can get the fish, but obviously it's better to be up through night. So that's one mistake they make. Obviously, number two, obviously, on the tidal, baiting up-wise, obviously, a lot of them don't know when to bait up, and, you know, and obviously when you should bait up. And I normally bait up really when, when it's on high tide. When it's like, when they virtually stop its side and everything goes slack, that's when I normally get the bait out then because your bait's going right down to where you want it. Yeah. So a lot of, and obviously, what I tend to do, I do, in which they make the mistake, I might get to a peg and I'll bait up first, then I'll leave it for an hour. I'll set up, leave it for an hour. A lot of people get there and they cast straight in 
they get that one fish straight away and they have nothing after that. So I like to obviously bait up if I can, leave it for an hour, just, you know, let them have, get confident, they not have a free, free feed, you know, then I'll get my rods in. Then if I'm catching, then, you know, I'll bring the rods in a little bit, give them another few more swappers out, a bit more bait, let them build that confidence back up again. But a lot of people just turn up, cast the rod straight out, and, and you can get a fish, you know, first cast, but they're not there, you know, the spookies, they're not there in numbers. I think it's better to build the swim up, get them confident. So I've seen a lot of people do that, really. Uh, a lot. Another one is casting. Okay. Obviously, if you need to cast at certain areas, obviously a lot of people are, oh, will my rods cast it out that far? And they're not confident because they think they're going to break the rod. And I'm saying they won't break your rod. So obviously, because if you're not casting in the right area where you need to be, and obviously you know, you're not going to catch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sometimes you can be chucking 20 foot out. Sometimes it can be like 60 foot out. But certain areas you've got to be in certain places. So obviously casting, so some people have got, a lot of people I take with me are good, are good anglers. You just need a little tweaking. Yeah. Some people take with me, you know, obviously are, are newcomers to the river. So obviously I like that because then obviously I can teach you my why fish, if you know what I mean. If you know what I mean, it's easier because obviously they do, obviously everybody who have, have come with me has done what I've said. But for a newcomer, they're more like, yeah, they copy everything I do. They've yeah. rang me up two weeks before and they've bought everything I use. The braid, the line, everything, bait, which is great. So that's, that's, what, I, that's what I find it like. It's just better for me if obviously, if you're like a newbie to the barbell fishing. An important, a big thing for me is fish care. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, a lot of people just get into barbell fishing and some people aren't that, you know, you know, experienced. They don't know what to do properly. Obviously, I, when I catch a barbell, I'll leave it in the net for five minutes before I take the hook out. Make sure it's upright, facing the flow. You've won the battle, you've caught the fish, you've won. It's going nowhere. Leave it in the net to recover. I see it as if I've done the London Marathon and I've got to the finish line and somebody's basically turned me around and says, right, run it back now. Yeah? You can't do it. You're going to die. You just can't do it. Yeah. So I'll let the barbell recover in the net. If it's a good fish, obviously the scales are set up, it's zeroed. I've got one of them core and fast mats, yeah, which I think are absolutely brilliant. I think everybody should have one and be on the, on the river. What is it? Because I'm not familiar with them. But it is obviously like a, it's not square, but it's like a, I'd say it's about three and a half foot long by about a foot and a half foot right. wide and about probably nine inches deep. And you can fill it up with water. Right, okay. I fill mine up with water, I do, basically. You get an unlucky mat as well. And if you've got a good fish, obviously once you've obviously let it rest and you've took your count and you're all set up for the pictures and all that lot, I bring it over to the cold and fast mat and I stick it in that. Right. Because it's got fresh water in it out the river. You know, the barbell's under the water, it's submerged. So, you know, the stone the stone in the water, if you know what I mean. So obviously they obviously do the weighing, quick photo. Then it's still obviously it's better than flapping about on a nooking mat. Yeah. In the fresh air, isn't it? Yeah. So I use them. I think everybody should have one and be honest. I think they're absolutely brilliant. I mean, the amount of people I know have bought them after seeing what I do with them. It's just like loads of people. I think they're a brilliant bit of kit. And obviously, after you've weighed the fish and done all that lot, I put it back in the net for two or three minutes, make sure it's upright and it's where. And obviously, I'll just lower the net. And, you know, and they, and they, they kick off every time. Yeah, yeah. If you let them rest for that first five minutes before knocking them, they're fine. If you get that barbell in after a good fight and you take it straight out of that water, unhook it, weigh it, take eight pictures of different every angle going and just put it back in the net, it's going to, a lot of time, it's going to die. Yeah. You just, just, just rest them. I see, I see them, I see people do that and I, I go over and just like explain. And obviously some of them don't know. You know what I mean? Two people, so many people just want to rush to get everything, get it out. But obviously it's not going anywhere. It's fine. Yeah. So obviously when I take people with me, obviously I teach them that. You know what I mean? And some of them know it already anyway, but some obviously don't. So, uh, you know, I think that's a big 
fish care, in my opinion, is like important. Yeah, I, unfortunately, you see it on Facebook all the time when somebody says, just seen a barbel coming past, shoddy fish care again, and you see him go down the river, and it, it, it's not right. And the um, the amount of people as well that you see, and they get slated. As soon as you see somebody who stood up holding a barbel, like properly stood up holding yeah. it, you just think, oh, mate, you're going to get so much stick. And a lot of it could be more constructive. A lot of people could just take the time to go, look, you're obviously new. You don't know what you're doing. Next time, kneel down, hold the fish, and give constructive advice. But every time you see one of those hosts, you think you're going to get battered, and they and they really take some stick. And you yeah. think, well, that that person might never go barbel fishing again, or never post a photo. But I, I don't know. I I would rather them get some stick and learn from it rather than people go, yeah, lovely fish, and not mention it, and then drop one or you know, yeah. yeah. Fish care's got to be the most important thing. Yeah, well, yeah. when I see pictures like that, I always comment and say, well done, but, you know, in future, if you don't know, because you could be a first-time angler, you know, you know, don't stand up with it. You know, obviously, get close to the ground. If you've got one of them core and fast mats, obviously, the fish is over that. So if it does flip or whatever, it's going to go in the water. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And if you if you stood up and it flips and it hits the floor, you know, it's a good chance you're going to die, to be yeah. fair. Yeah, yeah, you know indeed. What I mean? So, yeah, when I see them pictures, I, I do think... Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> what I'll do wait that, for the bomb. that yeah, if you just wait for the wait for the comments. Uh I'll um I'll look out that uh that map and I'll put a link in the description below and I'll I'll link to your baits as well to Vortex Baits so anybody who's is interested in them can go and see what you're talking about. Um one of the other things you mentioned as well while you were talking then was when newcomers come along and they don't know whether their tackle's gonna be right or not. I think one of the most question ask questions that I see all over about Trent angling is, is this rod all right? Is this reel all right? And people do get, I think too caught up in the minutiae of it. And they just, they want the very best rod and the very best reel and they get over concerned about it. So if someone's coming to the trend, what should they buy? What, what's the test curve? What's the real size in your opinion? In my opinion, if you're fishing the tidal trend, you know, I think you need anything from two pound upwards, two point two five, two point seven five. You know, especially if it's in flood. You know, sometimes you're chucking out four ounce. You know, sometimes you need six, seven. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I think if you've got a, you know, a powerful rod, it helps in the fight as well. You don't want to be playing a fish on a one point seven five. You know, when there's a bit of water on it and it's taking you twenty five minutes to get it in because the fish is, you know, the fish is getting tired out. Yeah. I use basically I use uh, the Corum 2.2s and the Diawa uh, 2.75s. Right. I use them. I do. And on tidal strength, that's what I would suggest anybody goes for. Do you definitely? Go on. So, no, go on. What are you saying? Yeah, definitely two pound to 2.2 for definitely. Or I, you know, depending on if it's low or it's in flood. If it's in flood, you need. I think you need a decent powerful rod. To be fair. Yeah, I agree. And, and you're absolutely right. The fish need to come in quick. There's no, there's no point leaving them out there, especially when it's low oxygen levels. It doesn't do them any yeah, good. You, you, get, get them in quick. Get the hook out. Get them recovered and, and get them back. Yeah. Uh, do you fish with quiver tips or solid tips? Are you just expecting that wrap around or are you looking for something a bit more subtle? No, I just fish with solid tips. The rods are used, to be fair, the corn ones and the hour. They're not pokers. They actually bend. And obviously, you can see most of the taps and bangs, to be fair. So, uh, no, I don't use a quiver tip. No, it's just a like, just two-piece rod, obviously, two, either two, 2.2s or 2.75s. And uh, they're quite, you know, they're quite, you know, they're all action through, you know, they bend right through. You know, yep. they're not like, like carp rods where they, like, don't move unless you're up, you know, like 50 pounds or something. I, well, I'd, I've got a set of carp rods because I carp fish. And even yeah. when I've had big big fish on them, they, they don't bend. The, the purpose of them is to throw a lead a very, very long way. And um, yeah. I have more fun on my kids' 10-foot dwarf rods when I catch a fish because it bends all the way through. It'll take line. And even a 20-pound fish, you can have a load of fun with it. But my NGs, you just, you're kind of just winding it in. And it takes a lot of the fun away. Yeah, I mean... The rods I use, you know, you can feel every knock and bang when you're playing the fish. Yeah. It's not like you don't get, you can feel everything. 
You know what I mean? They're good rods, so I wouldn't use them if they were like pokers, because obviously I like to feel the fish myself. In fact, you know, because I don't, I don't use uh, clutch. I use backwind. You see. Do you? Yeah, yeah. So I like to feel everything on the rod. So, you know, they are good rods. So that's what I, that's what I say. Get on the trend. You know, two normal level. You yeah. know, two pound test curve will be fine. Yeah. You know, on the trend, you'll be using like three to four ounce easily. But when there's that extra water on it, and you need seven, eight ounce. And it's not just because you, you could hold with six, it's just the amount of rubbish coming down. Yes. Is where you need to use eight and nine ounce. Yeah. You know, you're not casting it far, you know, you're casting probably a rod out, two rod lengths out at most. But yeah. Because of the rubbish coming down, I don't like my bait moving round. And if it moves round, nine times out of ten, you're snagged up mm. or something. So, yeah, no, you, you, you make a good point. Uh, on the upper, I use two and a quarters, but same as you say, I in, in the middle of the winter, I might go up to eight ounces, but that is literally just a, an underarm flick yeah. out any more yeah, than yeah. that, and you're gonna have problems with your rod. But, um, yeah, there, there's no big chucks up here anyway, mate. Yeah. I've learned so much from you. I well, thank you very, very much for your time. I'm sure everybody who listens to this, no matter how much experience they've got, is going to learn something. You've been super generous with your knowledge. Do you, I uh, thank you very, very much for sharing all that you've done because you, uh, there's a lot of subtle things that you do and there's a lot of techniques that you do that a lot of people won't have thought about. And hopefully it's going to make people think a little bit more about how they approach the fishing and the, the subtleties of it all. That all and, and it'll certainly help me put more fish on the bank. I've been fishing 40 years, but there's some things that you've got. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to nick that. That's quite a good idea. So on a personal yeah. level, it's been fantastic. Um, yeah. Genuinely, mate, thank you for your time. I've really enjoyed it. No, I, I've enjoyed it. And if people can learn something off this, what we've done tonight, then brilliant. Because I, I like helping people out. I'm not a jealous angler. You know, I love seeing other people catch, whether they're with me or not with me. You know, if I think they need help, I'll go out and I'll land the fish with them. You know what I mean? So, yeah, if I can help people out, great. I, you know. Well, I can tell from your demeanour, you know, when you're talking about guiding, you get a smile on your face and you're like, well, I can oh, help yeah. this guy do this. And you can tell you take that vicarious pleasure. And any time anybody catches a fish with you, it's like you're catching a fish as well. You can tell you're just, you're the right demeanour to be a guide. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, most people have guided, have become friends now. I mean, a lot of them rebook in again, to be fair, but it, it wouldn't bother me if they didn't. You know, if, you know, they, they go out, out, that smile on the face and, you know, they always they always say they've learnt something, which is good for me. And obviously they've learnt how to treat a barbel, which is important to me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and they've gone home, you know, with a good memory and a, and a good picture, you know, nice fish. Sometimes it's a PB, so happy days. <laughs> so if somebody wants to book you how do they find you well basically uh i'm obviously i'm on facebook obviously i've got my own obviously barbell page uh, i'm on instagram and uh, a lot of people find me on obviously the internet or what i've just said but word of mouth but cool. you know, it's mainly facebook to be fair or instagram well i'll so, put all your links same as i say i'll put all the links to those products and i'll put a link to your uh your fishing page so if anybody wants to come and find you and based on the last podcast i suggest that they do because uh, mate that's been a gold mine i'm i'm conscious that you've been kind enough to give up your evening so genuinely thank you for doing that it's it's been an absolute pleasure yeah well thank you for having me on i've enjoyed it i'm well, looking forward to it all day really because like i said to you if you're not fishing next best thing is just talking about it isn't it you know what well, I mean? Don't don't let on because I'm I'm trying to make out that this podcasting thing's you know really difficult, but it's just a brilliant way to you know spend time with really good anglers. And as you say, what what a fantastic way to spend an evening. If you can't yeah. fish, talk about it. Yeah, yeah, I've I've really enjoyed it. And to be honest with you now, what are the, what got river now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At some point, we'll fish together. Either you come up my way. And come and fish on my stretch, or I'll come down to you. How's that? Yeah, you're, you're more welcome to come down my way, and I'll take you on a few stretches, and uh, we'll get a few fish out and have a bit of a laugh, and uh, you know, have a good laugh. And I promise I won't sleep on the second night. 
Yeah, yeah, get sleep in the day. <laughs> <laughs> right, perfect. Cheers, mate. Thanks for coming on. Cheers, thank you. See you, mate. Bye. Yeah, bye, bye.